10, we just finished with probably the most familiar verse of chapter 10 and one of the more familiar verses of 1 Corinthians uh, there in verse uh, 13, no temptation has taken you but such as common man and God is not will not allow you to be tempted but what you're able but is faithful with the temptation he will also provide a way of escape that you may endure it to the end. So therefore, beloved, okay, now a couple things there. Remember, Whenever you see therefore, you ask, why is it therefore? Because of what he just previously said. So he says, therefore, my beloved. Now he's affirming their salvation. He's affirming their relationship with one another. In fact, yeah, oh, in verse 17, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we partake of the one bread. So he's He's uh, reminding them of the unity that we have in Christ because we're in Christ. The Christ in me and the Christ in you make us one. Uh, that's what is such a blessing when you would meet brothers and sisters from around the world that have a different culture, a different language, um, sometimes a different style of worship. And you're one together because Christ in them and Christ in us makes us one. Language isn't a barrier. Uh, ultimately, it can be a barrier of communication. So both times I went to Crimea, I had a translator. In fact, I had the same translator both years. And when I went to Bulgaria, I had a tra young man, 22 years old, um, freshly out of uh, the Bulgarian army, who was my translator. And we just... Our first session was a little shaky, but after that we just clicked, and it was, it was just um, a wonderful experience. One because he was a believer. My translator in the Crimea, she was not a believer, and so when I would talk about spiritual things, that she would repeat them, but she had no connection to them. But uh, Andrew uh, and I really clicked because he was a believer. So he, as I was teaching, he was understanding and able to communicate that, I think probably in a more effective way than my translator in the Crimea, because we were brothers, we were united as brothers in Christ. And so, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people, or why, I think King James may translate that, wise people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Okay, Here's, He's saying, you understand the gospel enough to understand what I'm saying. And um, so he says, judge for yourselves what I say. If it's lining up with what I previously taught you, is it lining up with scripture? So you're wise enough to judge that for yourself. And so now here's his referral to the Lord's Supper. He says, the cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Now, um, let me check King James there. This word participation, which he repeats, in that the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Um, I want to double check. I, I want to say sharing is the word. But I don't remember from King James. But communion. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not communion of the body of Christ? Now that word communion, participation, sharing, is the word koinonia. Now that's significant because all the way back at the beginning of this letter, Paul is emphasizing who these Corinthian believers are, calling them back to who they are in Christ, that they have been set apart, they've been sanctified. They're, verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 1, I give thanks to my God always for you because the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus by the way, there's no other place we find grace 
except in Christ. Now, there's a kind of general grace that God gives mankind, but the grace that is saving grace, grace that makes us right with God, can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and knowledge, that's why he says you're wise enough to discern for yourself, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, wait for his second return, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the verse, verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's, that's that word koinonia. We were called into fellowship, into koinonia. And he's saying here that the cup of blessing represents the means by which we are called into communion or participation or sharing uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're called into koinonia. Uh, that word was used of a broken bone being put back to get, being put back together and then it growing back together and uh, becoming stronger than before it was broken. And so Paul's saying, now the idea here is um, participating in idol worship. Okay? He's saying uh, we need to flee idolatry. Let me just jump ahead. Um, verse 18, consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices per participants in the altar. Uh, what do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to participate or to be in koinonia with demons because we're in koinonia with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are brought into fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we are. And we're not to be brought into fellowship with idol worship. And ultimately, he says, behind those idols are demonic activity. Uh, false religion is propagated by demonic activity. And, uh, and I'm not talking necessarily about uh, the boogeyman and, and uh, darkness in the sense of, of uh, a horror show. It, it's very subtle, very deceptive. Uh, and that's what false religions are. They're, they're very subtle. Now, some of them are, but most of them are very subtle, uh, very deceptive. Uh, the Mormons uh, like to use uh, the Bible like to use uh, their Mormon Tabernacle Choir and the, and the singing of traditional hymns to uh, open a door for people to walk through to get to their false teaching in the Book of Mormon and their other books that are not Scripture. They do not have the equivalency of Scripture. In fact, they are false teachings. They are heretical teachings. And... Uh, behind that deception is demonic activity. And uh, Joseph Smith didn't speak to an angel called Moroni. Uh, whatever he got, he got out of his own imagination or the instigation of uh, the powers of darkness to help him propagate a false religion. Now, Mormons want to be under the umbrella of Christianity, but they are not. They deny the cardinal doctrines of the deity of Christ. They deny the true purpose of Jesus dying on the cross. Now, they'll talk about Jesus dying for our sins, but that's not their means of salvation. Their means of salvation is a means of works. And by the way, ladies, uh, you don't get to participate in that. Your, your main responsibility 
is just to birth children to repopulate some supposed future earth or world. Because here's the core of Mormonism. I don't want to get off this rabbit too far. But here's the core of Mormonism. As man is, God once was. They, they would say that God once was just merely a man, but he evolved into deity. And as God is, man will be. That men, they go through the Mormon process, go through the temple and all those rituals, can attain deity. And then they're going to have their own little earth with a bunch of wives to have babies, to replenish that earth with people, and then be the God of that earth. As God, as man is, God once was. As God is, man will be. It's a false religion. Um, Joel Witness is a false religion. Charles Taz Russell is a false prophet. And so behind these false religions, behind the idol worship that was predominant in Corinth, Paul is saying, are demons. And when you would participate in that, you are engaging in koinonia with false teaching, with demonic activity. And Paul said, that is not what we are as followers of Jesus Christ. So he says, I speak to sensible people. I speak to wise people. My beloved, he's, he's affirming their salvation. He's affirming their true faith. And he's saying, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're sensible, you're wise, you can judge for yourself what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ, our union with Christ, our koinonia with Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation or a koinonia in the body of Christ. Now we just had the Lord's Supper this past Sunday. And I am agree with Swingley uh, from the Reformation that the elements are symbolic. The bread represents the body of Christ. The broken bread represents the broken body of Christ. The cup of juice uh, represents the shed blood of Christ. Now what those are referring to, what they're pointing to, is his death. His death on the cross. And what baptism does and what the Lord's Supper does, it reminds us of our koinonia, our participation in the blood of Christ, our participation in the body of Christ spiritually. That we are united with him in his death. Broken body, shed blood. But we don't stay there. We're united with him in his resurrection. And we're to walk in newness of life. Paul's saying that's what we as believers are involved in. That's what we as believers are in koinonia, that we are been given, called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful by whom, God is faithful by whom you are called into the koinonia of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And when we receive and observe the Lord's Supper, this cup of blessing, which we bless, we rejoice in, we give thanks for, not because these elements save us, but they point us to the one who does save us. They point us to our koinonia, our participation, our communion, our sharing in Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, and that we can walk in newness of life. Um, what do I imply then that food offered verse uh, 19 food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything no Paul knows that uh, that food has no power that idol has no power but he's saying behind that idol is deception is a means of compromise is a means of union koinonia with the wrong spirit the spirit of the age the spirit of the world 
And again, I'm not talking about necessarily witchcraft, wikia, occult things. Engaging in false teaching brings us into uh, the influence of darkness, not light. It, it brings us into koinonia, which that which is not godly. We are brought into koinonia, into fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why uh, Scripture uses the a knowledge of light and darkness, that we are children of light and we should walk as children of light. So he's saying, I know that that food and that idol is are nothing, but there is something behind them that can be dangerous and is dangerous. Uh, no, I simply imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. He's talking about compromise here. He's talking about no one can serve two masters, what he says in, John, in Mark's, Matthew's gospel. He's going to end up loving this one and hating this one or loving this one and hating this one. James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Now, there's a lot, there's a lot of people uh, in this world that um, they'll embrace uh, Christianity but they just add it to other religions. There's, there's a scene in the modern version of uh, The Mummy with uh, Fraser. I can't think of his first name now. Where he's the guy that discovers the tomb. And uh, he's got this, I guess, Egyptian Arab individual that's kind of his guide. And when he's confronted with the so-called regeneration of the mummy, around his neck are all kinds of, of uh, uh, necklaces and symbols from Egypt, uh, from Judaism, from Christianity, from all kinds, just a multitude. And when he's confronted with the mummy, he starts holding up all these different symbols, hoping that they're going to stay the power of the mummy. And a lot of people, they'll just grab from here and grab from here. Uh, Oprah Winfrey is probably the poster child of that approach to faith or spirituality. Really, it's an approach to spirituality. It's a false spirituality. It uh, has no, no reality to it. But going to grab a little bit from Christianity, grab a little bit from Judaism, grab a little bit from Islam, grab a little bit from Buddhism or Confucianism or Zoroasterism or draw a little bit from the new age, a little bit from the cult, and make that spiritual milkshake and then drink it. Paul says you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't mix false teaching with the truth and vice versa. We're not to live in compromise. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Now, what's the first commandment? I, I asked this, uh, I think, Sunday morning. If it wasn't Sunday morning, it was last night, our Bible study down in the city. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because there are no other gods. I can still hear my Hebrew and Old Testament professor, Dr. Garland, give the emphasis of that word before. He said what that really means is you, you are not to have any God before me, alongside me or after me. That there's no quantitative place to place a false god in relationship to me because I am so um, distinct and so other that no one can be categorized as before me, alongside me, or after me. There's no other god except uh, the true and living God revealed to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, one of my favorite sections of uh, the Old Testament in the prophet Isaiah 
is these chapters in Isaiah kind of in the beginning of the last third of Isaiah. Um, verse 11 of Isaiah 43, I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also henceforth, I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans and the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Um, we can jump over to chapter 45, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid, for I have told you from of old and declare it. And you are my witnesses. If there is a God besides me, there is no rock I know not any. In chapter 45, um, I am, verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. I equipped you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I formed light and created darkness. I made well-being and created calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, and salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who formed it, What are you making? Or your work has no handles? Woe to him who says to a father, What are you begetting? Or a woman, with what are you in labor? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, the one who formed him. Ask of me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children, the work of my hands? I made the earth and created man on it. It is my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their hosts. I have stirred him up in righteousness. I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and, and set my exiles free. Now, this is his servant. Not for the price of reward, says the Lord of hosts. And over in chapter 46. Um, List to me, O house of Jacob, verse 3, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who has been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear, I will carry, and will save. To whom will you liken me, and make me equal, and compare me, that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales hire a goldsmith. And I read this before, but it's good to hear it again. He makes it into a little G God and they fall down in worship. They lift it on their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in its place. It stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. Remember this and stand firm. Recall to mind you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. 
calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. Listen to me, you stubborn of heart. You who are far from righteousness, I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. So Paul's saying, we can't compromise. We can't give devotion to anything or anyone except the Lord. Um, and shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? God is a jealous God. He, he guards his glory. He shares his glory with no one. And we're not to uh, be brought into fellowship or koinonia with false teaching, with idols, uh, false desires, our, our fleshly desires that, see, whatever we give our devotion to, whatever we give our heart to, that is our God. That is our little G God. And as believers, we should not go down that road because we have been brought into koinonia with the blood of Christ and the body of Christ, we've been united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection, and we're to walk in newness of life. Now let's continue. Uh, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things built up, edify. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the marketplace without raising any questions in the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you. See, hit this is from the person offering the food and probably thinks it's very special because it's been offered to a idol and thinks that there's some kind of magical power in this food. Now, it's kind of like don't ask, don't tell. What he says, be first part. If you have a clear conscience and you know that this meat is just meat, there's no power in it and nobody connects it to a false god or an idol or a sacrifice, Paul's saying just go ahead and eat it. It's just food. It's all it is, is food. But if the one who is offering it to you makes a connection, again, probably with pride, probably with expectation of this having some kind of magical power, Paul says do not eat it for the sake of one who informed you, and for the sake of conscience. I don't mean your conscience, but his conscience. Because he says all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but all things do not build up. See, again, this is emphasized, that he's emphasized in this section, in uh, 8, 9, and 10, our concern is for others and we put ourselves in the background we don't exercise our liberty to the expense of a brother or sister i do not mean your conscience but his for why should my liberty be determined by someone's conscience if i partake with thankfulness why am i denounced because of what I give thanks because of how it affects him how it affects the one who's offered the meal to you and their connection to false teaching and to idols and demonic activity so verse 31 so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do do all to the glory of God that's the bottom line that's what we aim for that's our target, the glory of God. God be glorified. You know, 
need old question from young people. Can I, can I do this and still be a Christian? Not just young people, but adults do that. Can I participate in this and still be a Christian? Well, probably in many regards, the answer would probably be yes. But the real question is, does it glorify Christ? Would you want to be involved here with Jesus standing right next to you? Because he is. That's what Paul talks about back in chapter 7 in sexual sin. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides in us. And when we participate in sin, we drag uh, at least the name of Jesus through the mud. So it says, whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, that kind of covers it. I mean, he's covered all, all the bases. Whether you eat or drink, because the context of food offered to idols... But he doesn't want to stop there. He just, wants to, he just doesn't want to say this is just about dietary practices. He says, whatever you do. I think that would include how we talk, what we think about, where we go, what we participate in. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many. Why? That they may be saved. Paul's talking about being polite, being gracious, being merciful, being forgiving. Some of the best grudge holders are Christians our so-called Christians. Some of the most unforgiving people are so-called Christians. I won't call them church people. Um, in recent years, probably the last 20 years, uh, I've shared with most churches I've been involved in that uh, some of the best people I've ever met have been in the churches that I've served and been involved in. Jewels, gracious, loving, Precious people, godly, loving, kind. But some of the meanest people I've ever met, I've met them in church. And so Paul's saying, give no offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, again, not to placate them, not for his advantage, not to climb up a ladder or to take advantage of people, but so that the grace of God can be ministered to them. He's saying so that they may be saved. I want to be gracious. I want to be kind. I want to be merciful. I want to be forgiving. I want to be long-suffering. That sounds like something we find in Galatians. In chapter 5. Verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, that is, debauchery. King James will say we're in excess. But be filled, and really that's present tense, be continually filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord, with all your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting one to another. Be continually filled with the Spirit. 
That's what Paul's talking about back in uh, Corinthians. Let me let me um, just back up to the first part of chapter five. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness must not be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which is out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral, immoral and impure and who are covetousness, which is idolatry, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not associate with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when... Anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For everything has become visible in the light. Becomes visible is light. Therefore, say, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And then what I just read, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And so... Um, Actually, that was from Ephesians 5. I want to get back over to Galatians 5. Um, but I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, are lust against the spirit, and desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envies, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such thing will not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> but the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk or keep in step with the Spirit, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So that's what Paul's saying. He says, I'm trying to please everyone with the evidence of Christ in my life, with the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in my life, with, with love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, mercy, grace, that's what he's talking about here. We have been called into union with the Lord Jesus Christ and to walk in newness of life. We'll step into chapter 11 next week, the Lord willing. And uh, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the grace that we have in Christ. We pray, Father, that we would <clears throat> go to your word and camp in Romans 6 and here in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, Ephesians 5, and Galatians 5. And see that we've been united, we've been brought into koinonia with the Lord Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. And that, Father, uh, we've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ. So help us, Father, to walk as children 
of light in this dark world. And help us, Father, not to engage or entertain those things which are false, those things which are idols, those things which we put before you. Father, may we have no other God but you, revealed to us in your Son, the Lord Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you, and uh, we're continuing in our study in Psalms. I'm tossing a couple of Psalms back and forth a little bit, uh, on which I'm going to land on this Sunday. So I really can't tell you. I, I'm kind of leaning towards Psalm 21 right now, uh, but I also have given, given consideration to Psalm 10. Uh, so I'm kind of praying over those and studying on both of those and but we'll continue in our study on Psalms in morning worship. We have Bible study at 9.30. I believe they're just starting the Gospel of John, uh, my favorite gospel. Um, so if you have a church home, be faithful to your church home. If not, uh, maybe come by and visit with us the, this coming Sunday at 10.45. Uh, Lord bless you. We'll see you next week.